Sermons get ready to get going, life in 4K, study through Philippians. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll jump into that. Thank you, Father, for this morning, and we pray that, Lord, that you would just help us to have, indeed, a little bit more clarity in the life you call us to live. Uh, Father, may these words not return void, as you have promised, and Father, may you speak, may what I say be cast aside, and Lord, may you speak into our hearts and our minds to your glory. Amen. Uh, If I were to ask you the question, you know, what is your purpose? Undoubtedly, many of you would give me what I would say a Sunday school answer is. You, you would tell me what it is that you think that I want to hear, or you would say what it is that you feel like you are supposed to say or what needs to be said. That's often, what we, that's often how those type of questions get answered. Or if we were to make the statement, I am living for, you know, how would you finish that statement? It's been noted that people that do not have purpose in life, they're more inclined to have depression, become obese, become discouraged, and even, as we might even say, become lazy. I came across a couple guys that have seemingly, uh, photos of guys that have seemingly lost purpose in life. You got like this guy here who is just like eating the spaghetti one noodle at a time off his chest. I don't know if it's one long noodle or a series of noodles, but at any rate, he's going to put forth as little effort as he can to eat that plate of spaghetti. And then there's this guy who isn't going to put much effort into drinking his drink. He even put a plate below it to make sure it was just high enough to get the straw to his mouth. And then you got this dad who is definitely my hero. He is sitting there with a string swinging his daughter This is a win-win, friends, win-win. He gets to hang, drink his drink, swing the kid, because, you know, we've all been there just like, oh, my gosh, when is this going to end? And he's just like, this is great. We're all winning in this deal. But one of the the byproducts of, of, there are many byproducts when we don't have purpose. And so if we were to finish this sentence, I am living for, how would you finish that sentence? If different areas of your life, your mind, your heart, your time, Uh, your emotions could speak, they would probably say something different than you would verbalize. Mine would probably say something different than I would verbalize. But I was thinking about this. Like, what would our heart say? What would our schedule say? And maybe this would be true of you. If your heart were to speak and say, this is what my purpose is, it would probably say your family. Like, your family is your purpose. Your family is what, uh, what guides you and leads you, and all your decisions revolve around your family. Unfortunately, our families change. Kids grow up. They move on. They move out. Uh, you know, different family dynamics change around us, especially as it pertains to our extended family. If it were your finances that would speak, they would say your house and your car. Because you've got 50% of your income going to your house, you know, another four or $500 going out to a car payment. And your purpose revolves around keeping that house, paying for that car. That's what it revolves around. If it was your schedule that would speak, maybe your schedule would say your purpose is just trying to find that next, that next moment where you don't have something to do. Finding comfort, finding happiness, finding that moment when you can watch another show or binge watch some shows on Hulu or Netflix or something like that. You, you're somebody that we might say um, work isn't fun, but you work so that way you can have fun and you can create as much fun as you want, as, as you would like to have in your life. Ambition, if your ambition were to speak, it would say it's about the next title, the next promotion, the next degree. Like, yeah, well, that's just what you're living for right now. Or maybe it's your mind. And these are a bit more negative, but they're still our realities. That somebody who struggles with their thought life might Think about their sex or their next sexual escapade or they're dealing with addiction, maybe like alcohol. And right now your purpose revolves around that thing or it's bitterness. You were hurt in the past. And so everything you do revolves around that bitterness or it's just your ex. It can be your ex anything, your ex-boyfriend, your ex-girlfriend, your ex-husband, your ex-wife, your ex-employer. Like that is your purpose. Everything that you have going on inside of your head, this thought loop revolves around these types of things. Well, the Apostle Paul, he is going to address what our purpose really ought to be for in life. Because in his life, the circumstances of his life, as he writes this letter to this church in Philippi, are the types of things that are, the characteristics at this particular season of his life are not the type of things that would lead someone to say they're living a fulfilled life. The characteristics of his life are devoid of many of the things that give us purpose in life. And what I have found is that generally when our purpose is off, or we don't have purpose at all, 
Like often it's very difficult to get motivated to live the life that we ought to live. And so before we jump into this passage of scripture in which Paul answers what our purpose ought to be, we need to understand some of the context of his life over the preceding five years that led up to him writing that letter. Like for example, five years prior to him writing the letter of the letter of Philippians, he is in Jerusalem and he essentially goes to church. It's the temple. He's worshiping. Some religious leaders learn that he's in the temple worshiping. They know the message that he's preaching about Jesus. And so they go, they cause a riot. They go and they drag Paul out. They beat him with the intention of killing him. A Roman commander learns of what's going on. He intervenes and saves Paul's life, but he assumes that Paul has done something wrong. And so he tells, he sentences him to a flogging. And then Paul raises his hand and says, hey, you can't do that. I'm a Roman citizen. Because you you can't sentence a Roman citizen to anything unless they've gone through a fair trial. And so Paul hasn't gone through this trial. And so therefore the Roman commander doesn't want to get stuck um, with Paul and, and find himself in trouble. And so he hands Paul off to a man that's known as Felix. And Felix sees Paul as this guy that's got friends and enemies. He's hoping his friends will bribe him. So he keeps him in prison for two years without a trial. And Paul just sits there. And he waits. And then eventually a new governor comes in. The new governor sees what's going on with Paul. And he says, you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't have been here. I'm sending you back to Jerusalem to get this matter resolved. But Paul knows Jerusalem's a one-way ticket. Because the same people that wanted to kill him are still there. And so Paul appeals to Caesar. He gets on a ship. He travels to Rome. The ship ends up coming upon a storm. The, The ship gets broken up. They end up floating in sea for a few days. He lands on an island. Eventually another ship comes along picks all of them up, takes them to Rome, and it's there in Rome that he's held under house arrest and he's chained to a Roman guard. Years have passed at this point and Paul never did anything wrong. All that he did was come to church one day. And when he did that, his whole life began to spiral out of control and now he's awaiting trial to to find out whether he will live or whether he will die. And if you or I were in Paul's situation, we would be asking the question, God, what is the purpose of this? God, this isn't fair. God, what is happening to me is holding me back. God, you have things that you want me to do in my life, but these circumstances are not allowing those things to happen. But it's in the midst of all this that we read the letter of Philippians and we find that Paul still has purpose because his purpose transcended his circumstances. And this is what he writes in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 of his purpose. For to me, to live is... What I am living for is Christ, and to die is gain. Whether I live or whether I die, my purpose is Jesus. Let me say it to you this way. Paul's purpose is found in who he's living for, not what he is living for. The best purpose that we can have can be found in a who, not a what. And you know this, because a lot of you have been living for what's. You've been living to get the title or the promotion, or you've been living to fulfill that, that addiction or that, again, that fantasy that you have. You've been living to get married and living to have kids. And eventually, I mean, those things are all good. And for the most part, especially if they're done in the right context, those things can be very good. But inevitably, there's something that's missing. Inevitably, those things kind of aren't as motivating and aspiring long-term as we would like them to be. And some of you, you're coming into that. You're about to get married. You're about to have a child. You, you are getting the promotion. You've got the new business adventure. But inevitably, if you're living for the what, there's going to come a point in which the what's just going to disappoint you. The what's not going to motivate you anymore. The what isn't going to be as fulfilling as it ought to be. And so Paul's like, it doesn't matter what my circumstances are. His purpose up until this point was seemingly to plant churches. And now for five years, he's been unable to do that. All that he's, he's been unable to do that because he's been imprisoned. And so now he's just waiting. His purpose that he seemingly had is lost, but it wasn't because his purpose wasn't a what, it was a who. And there's three things that this passage of scripture that we're going to look at today shares with us to the benefit of living for the who. What is the benefit of living for the who? Well, that's what Paul essentially outlines in these few verses that we look at in the second half of chapter 1, picking up in verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers, they've heard about his situation. They heard that he's been imprisoned without trial. They've heard that he was beaten and left for dead. They've heard that he's been shipwrecked. They know that he's in Rome. They're worried about him. They're concerned about him. These people in Philippi, they love Paul. 
And he, so he's going to update them on his condition, his situation. He's saying, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Like, I know you think that what's happened to me is something that's keeping me from fulfilling my purpose, that's keeping me from moving forward in life, that's causing me to be depressed, but it hasn't. In fact, what has happened to me has advanced the purpose that I have for my life even more so. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ because he was chained to a guard. The chain was between four and 10 feet in length. He had four different guards a day that would often be chained to him. Six hour, uh, they had a six-hour schedule in which they were rotating people in and out. And Paul says that because of my chains, the thing, the very thing that would cause us to think that we've lost our purpose, he says, this has actually enhanced my purpose because the gospel is advancing even more. Most of the brothers in the Lord have even been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. And what we see here with Paul is this, is as he deals with this adversity, that, the, that his, his purpose, being Christ, is actually redefined how he views adversity. That's the lesson here. Is like when you live for the who, is living for Christ will help you to redefine the adversity that you deal with in life. Let me illustrate it this way from a worldly standpoint to a spiritual one. This guy's name is Steph Curry. He's one of the best basketball players in the NBA. He wasn't always thought, that it was never thought that he was going to be as good as he has, has become. Because the first three seasons he was in the NBA, he was dealing with major ankle problems. It was, reg, it was a regular occurrence that he would have a significant sprain that would put him out for several days. There was one stretch in which he had five major sprains in two months over the course of 26 games. That's incredibly debilitating. The doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. What was wrong? The CAT scans kept coming back clear. So he goes in for a major invasive surgery. In some cases, in some parts of it, it was even reconstructive. But as the doctors went in to this, cut into his ankles to perform the surgery, they found that there was significant scar tissue there that was causing his ankles to actually become weak. And that's why he kept having these unusual sprains that were taking place. So they cleared out all the scar tissue. They changed the plans of what what the surgery was going to consist of. And then after a few months of rehab, he comes out of it and is better than ever. Ends up with multiple MVP seasons. They win several NBA championships. He's going to be considered one of the greatest basketball players to ever play the game. But he wouldn't have gotten to that place if he hadn't gone through the adversity that he went through with the ankle sprains, ultimately choosing to go through surgery, which ultimately would lead to him, the condition getting fixed, and then him becoming better than he could have ever imagined. My point is this, is that often it's the adversity and the challenges that we go through in life. If we allow them to, can God can do more things with those than we could have ever imagined him doing if we allow him to intersect into those. If those things aren't our purpose, God will do more with it than you could ever dream. And some of you, let's apply this to our lives, some of you are chained to some things that you feel like are holding you back. You're chained to some things that you feel like are keeping you from fulfilling your purpose. You're chained to a bad marriage, as you would define it. And you say to God, God, what is the purpose of me being with this person? I thought you wanted me to be happy. I thought you wanted us to be content with each other, but we're not. And maybe God isn't as concerned about our happiness as we think, and maybe he's a little bit more concerned about our holiness. I mean, certainly one of the, man, one of the greatest sanctif- the, the, one of the greatest means by which God has used sanctification in my life has been through my wife, helping me to die to myself that I can live more for him. Like, that's what marriage in many cases ought to do for all of us. It helps us to die to ourselves. And maybe you're chained to a rude neighbor, the kind of neighbor that like when you walk out of your house, you just hope their garage door isn't coming up because you don't even want to see them. You don't want to talk to them. In the middle of the night, you're thinking about how can I get rid of this person? Maybe I'll put a for sale sign out in the front of their yard and they'll get an offer the next day and they'll move, you know, that kind of a person. But, but here's the thing, they're rude to everybody. And the other people though, they have a choice if they want to talk to that person or not. But you don't because they're your neighbor. And maybe, just maybe, God is wanting you to demonstrate love to them. An unconditional love. A love that is motivated and inspired by the love that God demonstrated to us in Jesus. You can't avoid them because they're your neighbor. 
Maybe God's got a greater purpose than you can even imagine for that neighbor or that person that you're interacting with that seems to get under your skin constantly. Maybe it's a rebellious child, a broken down car, a broken down body. And maybe you're saying, God, if you would just help me to get healthy, then, then I would serve you more. I would do more things for you. I would go on mission trips. I would do all of these different things, Lord. If I could just be healthy, I would do so much more for you. But God's saying, you know, maybe I want you to be a light to the nurses, to the physicians, to the doctors, to the people that are tending to you while you go through chemotherapy, to the people that are tending to you while you're on dialysis. Maybe I want you to be a light to the person that's in your room when you're in the hospital about to go into surgery. Maybe, maybe I have another purpose for you, but for us, it's hard for us to think like that when we're living for the what and not for the who. Maybe it's emotional instability. Maybe it's financial instability. And maybe God is keeping your margins tight with your finances because he just wants you to increase your faith in him. He wants you to see that he'll do more with a little than you could ever do with a lot. He's wanting you to experience truly what it means to have a few loaves and then him to multiply that to feed thousands. He's wanting you to experience some of that stuff. But for now, the margins are thin. It's been said of this man, Handel, that when he wrote the Hallelujah Chorus, a song that has blessed people for centuries, one of the greatest pieces of, of music that's ever been written, he was at the lowest point in his life. His right side of his body was paralyzed. He was having financial problems, significant debt. He was being threatened with debtor's prison. And yet it was in the midst of this valley that he didn't have much of a what to live for, that God used that, used that to do something incredible through him. I mean, you, we don't, in Christianity, we don't realize like what would happen to many of the people, what, what kind of stories we would have if many of the people that have inspired our faith didn't ever have, have the adversity that they had in life. Like we would lose nearly every person that has ever inspired a, a Christians, um, that has inspired people to live out that Christian faith if they didn't go through adversity. Like this guy, Chuck Colson. What if he didn't go to jail after the Watergate scandal? Millions of prisoners wouldn't have learned about Jesus through the prison fellowship that he launched after he came out of prison. Or what if Joni Erickson Tata had never become a quadriplegic? Countless people have been inspired to press on through and to keep the faith as they themselves have gone through cancer, diabetes, you know, lung and heart issues, as they've gone through perhaps paralysis of some kind and dealt with different strokes and, the and then the, the outcome of those strokes. She's inspired countless number of people, and she's even said, I wouldn't do it any differently. And this person, Corey Ten Boom, who, what if she would have never gone to the Nazi concentration camp? Maybe you don't know her. She wrote a book called The Hiding Place. Highly recommend that you read the book. It's an incredible read. Her family was rescuing and protecting Jews as they were being persecuted in World War II. And eventually they were caught, and then they had to go to the concentration camp as a result of that. Her faith has inspired others to act in a similar way to help refugees and to help people that are being persecuted by their governments. Like, we've needed these people's stories because we need adversity. But here's the deal. We have to, as Americans, we have to allow Jesus to redefine adversity for us and to realize, you know what, as you go through challenges and problems that if you're living for the who and not for the what, man, incredible stuff can come out of that more than we could ever imagine. And so for the apostle Paul, that's what he said. He's like, I just want you to know that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. And so he's, re he's received ports, reports that there are certain people who are undermining him and their gospel is missing some pieces, you might say, at the very least. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. He's saying, I know that some of you are worked up about it. I know you're worried about this. I know you think this is a really big deal. But what's really a big deal is Jesus. Jesus is the main thing here. And so here's the point. When you're living for the what, you're going to get caught up in all these little ancillary things. But if you're living for the who, you like Paul or will say, what does it matter? As long as Jesus is getting preached, that's what matters. And here's the deal. Living for Christ will help you keep the main thing, 
the main thing. But if your main thing is a house or it's a position or it's maybe an income or, or something along, if your main thing is that, you're going to have a lot of troubles in life because circumstances are going to come up against you that you can't control. But when you live for Christ, you keep the main thing, the main thing. And this is something that in the church world we need to be reminded of. Because often Christians, and I even dealt with some conversations with this today, often Christians will be at each other's necks over ancillary minor things. Things like this. Worship music. It's too loud. It's too soft. The room's too lit. The room's too dark. I don't like that rendition of that song. Why don't we have hymns? Why do we have hymns? You see where I'm going with this? The preaching. It's too much Bible. It's not enough Bible. It's boring. It's not entertaining enough. It is too entertaining. The seats, you know, well, you know, we already talked about the seats. I'll leave those alone. The children's and students programming. I I don't like the curriculum. It's not Bible-based. It's too Bible-based. The staffing. Why do you have staff? You have too much staff. You have too little staff. Why is that person on staff? What's the deal with your staff? You shouldn't have staff. Outreach, mission strategy. You should be international. You should be local. Why do you even do this stuff? Everything's the mission field. You can't make, this is the stuff that we argue about in church world. These things like this. It reminds me of the story, a parable that I read about of an old man, his grandson, and a donkey. They're walking down the road. They've got several miles to get to where they're going. So the old man looks at the little boy and he says, you know what, son, you shouldn't have to walk. So he puts the little boy on the donkey. Well, they go, as they're going down the road, someone sees him and, and he says, well, why is that little boy making you walk that donkey? You're an old man. He should be the one walking the donkey. Then they, so they switch places. The old man ends up on the donkey. The little boy starts leading the donkey down the road by the rope. And then a little further down the road, somebody else sees him and says, what's wrong with that old man? He shouldn't be making that little boy pull the donkey while he's on top of the donkey. And the old man says, well, fine. So he's on the donkey. The little boy's on the donkey and they're riding along. And then they run into somebody else who says, look at those people. They're abusing that animal. Look at all that weight they've got on him. They've got their bags. They've got the saddle. Two people on there. That's ridiculous. And as the story plays out, inevitably the old man and little boy are carrying the donkey along (laughs) because you can't make everybody happy. I'm I'm reminded of uh, the church in the 19th century in Russia. It was a very vibrant church, strong. Um, Many believers and... It was the Eastern Orthodox, so it was a bit uh, different than what we experience today. In 1917, they were having a council meeting, and it was a rather tense meeting, you might say. Lots of arguing, yelling as they were going at each other in this particular meeting, 1917. It was in St. Petersburg, I believe. A few blocks down the road, there's another meeting that's taking place. Um, It's a meeting amongst the Bolsheviks. And it's led by Vladimir Lenin. And they are about to roll out the Bolshevik Revolution. And that revolution would ultimately lead to Marxism, socialism, communism, the marginalization of the church, atheism becoming rampant in Russia. The church could exist, but they weren't allowed to evangelize, which eventually led to the dying off of the church there in Russia. The church has never recovered since then, since that meeting. Uh, that the Bolsheviks launched out in 1917. So what was the Eastern Orthodox Church and the leaders meeting about? As just a few blocks away, this Bolshevik revolution was getting ready to launch. What were they meeting about that was so important that they would be yelling at each other and be angry at one another, especially when the country was on the cusp of a tipping point of this major revolution? They were arguing about the height of candles in their churches. The difference between 18 inches and 22 inches. To them, it made a big difference. It seemed really important. But now we look back on that 100 years later and we say, that's pretty embarrassing that you're arguing about that while you've got this revolution that's getting ready to launch in which millions of people are going to lose their lives. The church is never going to recover again because of this. And you're arguing about candles. You see what I'm saying? We got to keep the main thing the main thing. And we have to be mature enough to recognize what is the main thing. And if we're constantly getting caught up in bickering about these ancillary issues in the churches, 
we're going to end up one day with a culture that's going to turn on us, marginalize us, because we've been so caught up in the height of candles that we haven't been influencing it and helping it to be, to be a place where God's kingdom is advancing. When you live for the who and not for the what, you focus on the main thing. The Apostle Paul, he goes on, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit, so there's this connection here in the Greek that we may miss here, their prayers leads to God's provision of the Spirit, ultimately leading to where Paul is confident that he's going to be delivered. In other words, your prayers matter. And they matter for the people in your lives. And they matter for the church. Because it's through your prayers that God's spirit is seemingly stimulated and Paul is able to stay true and keep confident that he will ultimately be delivered. I eagerly expect and hope, this isn't a, again, when we see hope, we're like, well, it's an optimistic perspective on the future. Actually, in the original language there, he's thinking guaranteed. I guarantee you that one day I will not be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. And then he goes on to where we're going to lead into the third lesson here. For to me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. Whether I live, whether I die, it's all about Jesus. So if I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Paul presents it as though there's seemingly this choice of whether he lives or whether he dies. Now, I don't know how much of a choice he really had in this particular moment, but the idea here is, is that Paul's not regretting anything that he's done. He's not second-guessing the decisions that he's made that have led him to this place where he's under house arrest. And that's the beautiful thing about living for the who. is when you live for the who and not for the what, you don't second guess yourself as much. You don't have to second guess yourself as much. Living for Christ will keep you from second guessing decisions. Now, no doubt, no doubt, you may miss out on a few dollars because of a decision you make. You may miss out on an opportunity. But if that's your purpose, um, if that's your purpose, then yeah, you're going to second guess a lot of things. But if it's not your purpose and Jesus is your purpose, then you're going to focus on expanding his message, his gospel in every circumstance. And I know there's some decisions that some of you are wrestling with right now. Decisions that paralyze you. What college will I attend? What degree will I pursue? When will I go back to college? Will I pursue the doctorate? Will I pursue the master's? Will I finish my bachelor degree? And you're so conflicted over what does God want me to do? The apostle Paul would say, well, as long as Jesus is getting exalted in this situation, just make a decision and stick to it. What school will you choose for your children? Many of you parents wrestle with that. Will I go to a public school? Will I send them to a private school? Will I send them to a charter school? Will I homeschool them? So many options, it can become debilitating as you process through those decisions of where you want to send them to. A house purchase, that's a big deal. You go and you run around our city trying to find a, per a house to purchase. You can look at 20 houses and you're like, God, which one do you want me to pick? And God's like, just pick one and live for me there. What job will I choose? Will I stay at my job? Will I uh, leave my job? I've got four or five options of jobs to choose. Which one do you want me to choose, God? And he's just like, you know what? Just choose a job that fits you and where you are and what you're passionate about. And then be a light for me there. Or a spouse. Who will I marry? Should I marry this guy? Should I marry this girl? We wrestle with all these things because it's all about us and we're living for the what and not for the who. And the reality is, is a lot of these what's that we live for 100 years from now, they're not going to matter. They're not going to matter. I was kind of inspired by this story of this guy, Colt McCoy, that I read about as it would relate to what we're talking about today. He's currently the quarterback for the Washington Redskins. Before that, he was a very successful quarterback at the University of T Texas. When he arrived on campus at Texas, he was a, a, a solid recruit. They didn't know how good he would be, but he was a pretty good recruit. When you first arrive uh, and you start football, you have to choose a number. The number that he, that he wanted was four, but that number was already taken. Then he wanted 11. But as he was looking at the number 11, a trainer walked into the room and said to him, you do not want to choose number 11. 
And Colt's like, why? And he says, well, Major Applewhite had number 11, and people are going to compare you to him. And he's one of the best quarterbacks that the University of Texas has ever had, and you're never going to be that good. So Colt chose number 12 instead, one number higher. And then ultimately, by the end of his career, he would be the be- seemingly, statistically, the greatest quarterback to ever play at University of Texas. He set many national records as well, and he's gone on to have a very solid NFL career, much better than Major Applewhite. Well, not long ago, he received a phone call from the president of the, United, uh, president of the University of Texas who told him that his number was going to get retired there, at the, there in the stadium for this football team. And as he was on the field, his coach leaned over, the coach that he had at the time, Mac Brown, leaned over to him and said, Colt, that number is forever. Every time someone looks at that number, up there on that wall, they're going to remember how great you were on this field. Colt said he thought about that because he was talking to a group of people and it was a Christian group, actually. And he thought about what it was that his coach had told him there. There was about eight numbers that had been retired at that point. He kind of strung out the numbers into the future and just said, you know, over a few decades, there's going to end up being a few dozen numbers up there. Eventually, there's going to be maybe 100 numbers up there. At some point, they're going to have to unretire these numbers if they keep playing football. And that's when he said, he said, you know, there just comes a point where that greatness is going to get forgotten. And he said, I, that's why I've committed to live for something that's going to last. And he concluded his speech by saying these words, let's live our lives for the only thing that hundreds of years from now will still matter. Living a life for Jesus.